And in the program, he was the gentleman with the beard who speaks with a wonderful Bronx accent, one of my favorite physicists. He's a professor at Stanford. He's the Felix Bloch Professor of Theoretical Physics at Stanford. He's one of the discoverers of string theory, and he's really widely recognized as one of the most important physicists of our age. So I'm thrilled that he's in the program, and it's great that he will be joining us by Skype. And there he is. Hi, Lenny. How are you doing? Hi, Brian. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. So let me actually begin with not the question that was asked. We'll come back to it because there's another one that I see here that's relevant too, which I think is a nice lead in. The questioner from Twitter says that they read somewhere that you really wanted to be a plumber. But when that didn't work out, being a physicist was your fallback. The question is, is, is that right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I didn't want to be a plumber, no. I wanted not to be a plumber, but I had to be a plumber. My father was a plumber, his father was a plumber, and uh, I had to go to work as a plumber. I didn't have any choice. But uh, I managed also to go to college for a little bit and learn some physics and suddenly discovered I wanted to be a physicist. I didn't want to be a plumber. So uh, there's some truth to the story. But the story that I wanted to be a plumber is untrue. I hated being a plumber. <laughs> well, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so let me start with, with one of my own questions, and then we'll go to some of the others that people have. So I don't know if you have yet seen the program, because it hasn't aired in California yet. I don't know if you saw it uh, earlier. But one thing the program does not cover is the interesting battle that you had with Stephen Hawking about the issue of if something falls into a black hole, where does the information that that object contains go? So Hawking thought it would disappear, you didn't. We basically in the program just go from the result that it doesn't disappear, but perhaps you can fill in a little bit of the background there. Well, yes, I mean, uh, Stephen very sensibly raised the question, what happens to information when it falls into a black hole? Now, it is a really, really deep principle of physics. It's, it's so deep that we even f almost forget about it when we, when we state what the principles of physics are. A very deep principle of physics that information, information means distinctions, distinctions between a proton and an electron is a bit of information. The distinction between a male and a female is a bit of information. What it would mean for information to disappear is that distinctions which existed to begin with somehow disappear in a system and you can't ever, under any circumstances, recover those distinctions. That's a very famous principle in computer science that distinctions can't uh, disappear. A bit of information which you erase from your computer doesn't really disappear. What happens to it is it goes out into the atmosphere and uh, it uh, jiggles around among all the atoms, all of the uh, molecules and so forth. But if you had the power to be able to study every single molecule in the room, you could recover that little bit of information. On the other hand, Stephen said, wait a minute, stuff falls into a black hole. If it falls into a black hole, it's really gone. Besides which, black holes eventually evaporate. If they evaporate and things fell into them, where did they go? They're gone. The evaporation means the black hole disappeared. It's not in a black hole. On the other hand, uh, it's not, uh, it could not have gotten out of a black hole. The answer, which um, I'm not sure, I think Stephen sort of partly knew, but the answer is the information never really does fall through the horizon. It gets plastered onto the horizon. It gets spread over the horizon. It gets um, what we call sometimes scrambled over the horizon. And then the horizon evaporates and it comes back out into the Hawking, what's called the Hawking radiation. The Hawking radiation is the evaporation product. Uh, very much like a little bit of information, a little bit of ink falling into a, a puddle of water. And eventually the puddle of water dries up. What happened to that little bit of information that was in the ink? Well, it goes off into the evaporation products. The difference was that there was real good reason to believe that once something falls behind the horizon of a black hole, it really can never get out. Uh, it would have to exceed the speed of light to get out. 
And uh, so there was a puzzle there. The answer was a complicated answer and a very subtle answer. It turned out that the question of where a bit of information is, is it here or is it there, is not a precise question. It is not a question that we can always answer unambiguously. And the way that it turned out is the question was very similar to asking, if you look at a hologram, is the information about the hologram the piece of film, which has all of these squitchy, scratchy little marks over it, or is it the image? Well, it's both. The information that's in a hologram is both the information in the squitchy, scratchy piece of film, and it's also the information in the reconstructed um, image. So what falls behind the black hole is kind of like the image of a hologram. The surface of the hologram, or the, uh, the film, is more like the horizon of the black hole. And yes, the black hole does evaporate, and the result is that the, it's as if the film evaporated. And when the film evaporated, that information goes off into the atmosphere. Uh, and the image just disappears. Did that, did that help? Yeah, no, it does. Uh, so if I, if I paraphrase the, the question that was sent in, yeah. what is the holographic principle? And I guess the follow-up question that I might add, just for clarity, is all that we're talking about has to do with black holes. How do you make the leap from a conclusion that seems very tied to the physics of black holes to a conclusion that we might want to apply more generally even to the space that we're living in right now? Well, I can tell you, yeah, I mean, leaps are something that you can never really construct, reconstruct uh, how they happened. Uh, what happened in your brain that suddenly uh, made a leap? I can't explain what happened. But I can, I can tell you some things. Um, first of all, Anything that could be outside a black hole could also be inside a black hole. A whole civilization, a whole solar system, the whole works. If a black hole was big enough, it could contain all of that. So, on the one hand, there's no limitation on what can be inside a black hole. Anything could be inside a black hole. If the black hole is big enough, then that anything, the civilization, the solar system, and all of it, has to be also described by these little bits of information that get plastered onto the horizon of the black hole. But uh, when I was thinking about it, this was sometime around 1993, 1994, Gerard Tuft was also thinking a lot about it. We were thinking also partially about um, cosmology. Now, I was somebody who tended to believe that there was a cosmological constant in nature and that the universe was expanding or accelerated expansion. And if it is accelerated expansion, the universe is described by something that's called de Sitter space. De Sitter space is a very interesting thing. It's almost like an inside-out black hole. We are in the inside and out at a certain distance away, 15, 20 billion light years away, there's a horizon. And things fall out. They don't fall into the black hole. They fall out from our universe, out through that horizon. It's like an inside-out black hole, but don't get the idea that it means that we're inside a black hole. It doesn't. It means that the universe itself is, as I said, like an inside-out black hole, and things fall out through the horizon. I began to think, wait a minute, there's something going on here. What if the horizon of the sitter space is similar to the horizon of a black hole? And mathematically it is. Mathematically it's almost identical. Then that must mean that everything that's on the inside of the universe must be describable as a hologram or a kind of film on the surface way out there at the horizon of the sitter space. That's the way I was thinking about it. Gerard was thinking about it a little bit different, uh, but together we came together with this notion that everything within a region of space can be described as if there was, it was surrounded by a film where that film was, uh, was like a hologram. Nobody really took this too seriously at first. I took it seriously, but nobody really took it seriously except for a very handful of people. Ed Witten was one of them. Uh, Juan Maldacena was one of them. The reason it really became consensus science was because a very, very particular kind of space-time, anti sitter space, don't worry about what it means exactly. It wasn't the, it wasn't the space that was discovered by the sitter's ant. It's another kind of space. Anti-de-sitter space 
has the property that it has a kind of boundary. And it's a very special space with an enormous amount of symmetry, very amendable to mathematical uh, analysis. String theory had a lot to say about it. And by the time Juan Malvasena got his hands on it, he was able to prove very, very rigorously that this holographic idea was correct within that context. Once that happened, everybody jumped and said, oh, this holographic idea must be right. And uh, that's the status of it now. So when you, Most when you, walk, around, Lenny, when you walk around, do you, yeah. do you actually have in mind that you truly may be, in some sense, this holographic projection of laws that exist on this distant bounding surface? When you go well, to the store, is that in your way of thinking about how you go around everyday life? Yeah, that's, that's why I trip over my feet so much. Um, <laughs> you know the answer to that. Of course not. Uh, this is one of these things which is so bizarre and so peculiar that if your mind was wired to be able to really grapple with it and understand it in the deepest possible sense, you'd probably be dead because you would have tripped over your feet or walked into a wall. No, I don't. I'm a normal human being. I don't think holographically. <laughs> 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 so let me ask just one, one final question, which, which also comes in. What's your guess? Will the holographic principle one day be viewed on par with the equivalence principle or the principle of complementarity? Do you see it as ranking in that spectrum of contributions? Oh, I thought it already was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, think it, I think it's almost the case that that it is. I know very few theoretical physicists who I really think of as um, serious theoretical physicists that don't take it seriously. I think it's already reached consensus. Um, the, I'll tell you what the difference is. The difference is that the kind of experiments that you would have to do to confirm it are so difficult and so way out there beyond the range of our technology getting close enough to a black hole to be able to see the Hawking radiation from it, cooling the black hole to the point of view where it does radiate, all the sorts of things that you would need to do to turn this into experimental science are not fundamentally impossible, but they are way beyond the range of our technology. And they'll probably always be beyond the range of our technology. So it's it's not clear to me how it will ever become experimental science and i think that's very important um but as far as theoretical science as far as theoretical physics goes i think it has already achieved the level of being a um a basic principle and i don't think that's going to go away well great well thank you lenny for joining us and thank you for being in the programs you can see lenny in the other programs as well leonard suskind thank you appreciate it all right, so a couple of other questions that come in. One from Twitter is actually a follow-up to the one that was asked before over there. Do you think mathematics was invented by humans to understand?